Hello class! This is the introduction video for part 4, 18th century classicism um, from our textbook. There are many changes that happened during the Baroque and classical time period and I'm going to outline some of the more broad general ones for you in this video. So when we left the Baroque period we were focused on the age of absolutism which um, was where rulers controlled their subjects and their um, people living underneath them if they owned land, and we move on to the Age of Enlightenment during the Classical period, where human reason begins to overtake the authority of rulers and religions, religious organizations. So people start to think for themselves a little bit more and start to question why nobility and aristocracy have so many more privileges than the middle class or even the lower classes than that do um, when they're struggling to survive and to have basic rights. Um, all pre-established ideas, for the most part, are questioned during this time. So if something is a traditional or if something is how it has been for centuries, people question it during this time, including the question of whether or not God even exists. So there are many different things that are happening with people, um, just how they're thinking about things, and that is always going to trickle down to what results from artists and musicians and composers. So the Baroque period um, emphasized really heavy ornaments in both music and architecture and art, and that is going to give away to the Rococo style, which emphasizes lighter colors, transparent textures and music, um, curved lines, graceful ornaments that are going to go through all different types of art forms. This simpler aesthetic um, gave way to the neoclassical style, which was sought to recapture the simplicity of Greco and Roman cultures. So when you see incredibly symmetrical buildings that have columns in front of them, um, that sort of idea is considered neoclassical and, and supposed to emulate what we would have seen back in ancient Greece. Um, the music is going to be much more graceful and less bombastic in style than the Baroque period. And whereas Baroque music sought to um, highlight a single emotion in a piece of music, the classical period is going to contrast moods and fluctuate. Um, where the Baroque would emphasize very few rhythmic ideas and had always a sense of perpetual motion going till the end of the piece of music, the classical period seeks to produce the unexpected. So really changing up how something sounds, um, playing around with dynamics one right next to another, playing around with sudden pauses and the use of silence in music. So we're going to be hearing essentially homophonic music, everyone playing together, um, with some little snippets and fragments of polyphony when different voices are imitating one another. The music is going to be very catchy and very tuneful, so would, there's always a chance it will get stuck in your head. Um, during this time period, it was also very popular for composers to borrow famous melodies, famous popular pieces of the time for their pieces, um, such as Mozart wrote 12 variations on a melody that we recognize today as Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, but back then it was actually a very famous French um, song. The harpsichord is replaced by a piano that's not quite our modern piano, but is definitely getting closer. Um, the piano has the ability to play dynamics, which the harpsichord does not, and that's necessary for classical music. And since the harpsichord goes away, so then will the basso continuo. So we won't be using that term anymore, and it will be, um, it will be pretty much obsolete after the classical period starts. Uh, when we get to the classical area, the orchestra size starts to become standard. It's much larger than it was in the Baroque, but during the Baroque, from piece to piece, from movement to movement, you might have any different arrangement or number of instruments playing at the same time. And during the classical period, that kind of gets codified, and we have one set organization that is also going to start using instruments more than just strings on a regular basis. So woodwinds and brass instruments, as well as our first orchestral percussion instrument, the timpani or the kettle drum, gets introduced into music. And composers will try to exploit the particular sounds of individual instruments as opposed to having everyone play and sound about the same. 
As far as people go, the middle class during this time are wealthier, and they want to experience the same arts that nobility is. Um, and they're not allowed into palace concerts, so townspeople start to organize public concerts that cost much less. And this is the rise of where public concerts that we see today, where you purchase a ticket and go in and listen to an ensemble, begins. Um, since people are wealthier, printed music starts becoming very popular. Um, people start purchasing instruments. It was very common for a house to have a piano in it or a violin or for you to have your own instruments. And people were also paying to take music lessons at this time. And since there was such a rise in middle class music, composers start to write pieces that amateur players people in their homes can play, as opposed to during the Baroque period, a lot of the music was written for very talented, virtuosic players. Opera is going to go from very serious um, and dark to comic and a little bit more lighthearted. The topics will go from mythological characters to stories that deal more with people you would see every day, such as nobility in the middle class. And dance music goes from courtly dances like minuets to more rustic sounds. In the Baroque, Italy was the musical center of Europe, and when we turn into the classical period, all of a sudden Vienna, Austria, becomes where most of the influential music and composers are coming from. Private concerts and homes become very popular, um, where nobility and commoners play along together, along with professional musicians in orchestras. And the symphony is all of a sudden going to become the prevalent work, as well as chamber music, such as string quartets and string quintets, and opera are going to both evolve big time. And music appeals to everyone at this time, a wide range of people, and the classical period is the first music to consistently remain in performance immediately after it was written. So during the Baroque period, a lot of the music fell away out of popularity until it was rediscovered sometimes hundreds of years later. During this time period, the music from these composers was popular when it was written, has been since then, and maintains today. So the big three composers, the only three composers we're going to talk about during this time are G.F. Haydn, W.A. Mozart, and Ludwig Beethoven. And they are the three main classical composers um, that were really incredibly influential to one another as well as all of the other composers out there during that time. Haydn and Mozart were actually members of the same Masonic Lodge, so they were friends with one another. And Beethoven met both of them and in his lifetime. He played for Mozart, and he studied with Haydn. Um, and they both, all three of them, worked in a time of political and social upheaval. But as we go through chronologically in time, their lives are incredibly different from one another. And the first one we hit is Joseph Haydn. He lived from 1732 to 1809. And his lifestyle was very much in line with what a Baroque, um, a Baroque composer was dealing with at that time. He served 30 years with a wealthy aristocratic family, um, and he lived with them at their compound called Esterhazy. They were a Hungarian family, um, and he was essentially isolated from the world a lot of the time. He was considered a skilled servant, like a gardener or a gamekeeper. He would have worn a uniform, and he would have been expected to compose and behave in a manner that fit his employer. For example, um, if he would go into his employer's room every morning and ask if he wanted to hear new music, um, and if he did, he had to perform it at that time, and if he didn't, he would leave. So um, he wrote two operas and two concerts every single week, as well as chamber music, again, that was available every single day. The next composer we move on to is Mozart. He was lived from 1756 to 1791. He was a child prodigy in both performing and composing, um, where he toured the European world, um, playing for kings and emperors and queens, um, as well as writing pieces as early as the age of four. He was n had no interest in being someone's employee or servant, and he quit his court musician job to become a freelance musician in Vienna. And while he was successful, he was bad with his money, and he died incredibly poor. We actually don't know where Mozart is buried. He was, um, he was buried in a pauper's grave and moved, and so... Um, he didn't handle his money super well. And then we get to Beethoven, who has a different experience than both of the others two. He is from the end of the classical period. He lived from 1770 to 1827. 
and he is going to be a transitional character for us from the classical period in the romantic period which is our next chapter he lived his entire life as an independent musician in Vienna he never worked under anyone he solely wrote music performed music taught music. Um, he had a public career that led to high exposure in the noble class, so he was um, very familiar with many of the important people in Vienna at that time and would play and write for them as well as socialize with them. His popularity and his personality led to nobility treating him as an equal with respect, which is something that not a lot of other composers at that time had. So as we go through the period of the classical era, you can track how these composers lived and how they wrote because that affects the music we're going to hear. So I hope you enjoy 18th century classicism.